So this morning, it is, uh, uh, I get to introduce not only uh, one of the smartest people that I know, but a, uh, but a dear friend. Um, he, uh, his family, just a, a few years ago, they literally sold everything and, and moved to Thessaloniki because they saw that the, the refugees were just pouring into the country in Greece, and, and they really felt God's uh, pull to be there. Um, not only to reach out to those and to share the gospel, but even more so to be a, 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 uh, a trainer, to be a discipler, to be, be ones that will journey with these, uh, these new refugees and these new Christians and help them uh, develop as Christianity is brand new to them, all right? He's, he is a discipler, not only a discipler in Thessaloniki, but God sends him all around the world, and uh, he's always running into different people. He even, he even ran into somebody on a plane that he stays in contact with, and he's discipling them and all this other stuff. So he is just a discipler. He is, a, he is first of all, and first and foremost, a disciple of Jesus that goes and disciples others, and it has been a, uh, it's a privilege to, to know him, and, and it's, a, it's an honor to be able to introduced to him. So if you would uh, welcome uh, Daniel Napier, please. Thank you, Paul. Well, good morning, grace and peace to each of you. It's, uh, it's always a joy to be with you. And um, by the way, uh, notice that you guys are having a supply drive to take care of those who are being airlifted out of Afghanistan because they were standing by us. And I just want to say, way to go. I mean, that's, that's so needed right now. And, and I appreciate what I see uh, in your hearts here. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time with you this morning talking about the, the things that, that the Lord has been doing with us in Thessaloniki. And I want to, to interweave that with some reflections on this, this strategy that Jesus has um, the peculiar way that he goes about transforming the world, okay? So, uh, in Thessaloniki, we're, we're based in Thessaloniki, but we're really an international ministry that, for being so new, has a rather uh, remarkable reach. Um, <laughs> the, the people that we are training and, and discipling are having Bible studies over Zoom and Skype and Facebook uh, with people all through the Middle East. And so it's reaching back into the countries from which people fled when they came to Greece. And then the Lord has continued to open doors. And uh, as Paul said, I've, got, um, I've been making contributions to schools and spiritual formation programs and churches in places like uh, Marseille, France, and in Mexico City, and uh, in, in other places around Europe, and Russia. I've even been on a, a delegation by the United Bible Society to Shanghai. And so uh, the Lord continues to open doors, and we just kind of focus on stepping through them. And it's interesting because this is the sort of thing um, that was already happening back in Paul's day when he came to Thessaloniki, or Thessalonica, if you prefer. Uh, he he writes back to them not too long afterwards, and he, he notices that uh, the, the, the word of the Lord has not only come to them and changed their lives, but it sounded forth from them throughout Macedonia, down into Achaia where Athens is, and, and on out into the world. And so uh, we've been blessed to, to be a part of something that God's doing that's kind of similar to that. Uh, as Paul mentioned, we... Uh, sold everything, and we went over in November of 2018, and we were responding, well, to God, but um, as occasioned by this refugee crisis. And part of what we saw when we did a survey trip over there is that although there were a lot of people, never enough, by the way, but, but a lot of people uh, doing the first touch humanitarian care and evangelism, what we didn't find, uh, because that had absorbed all of the resources and energy, what we didn't find were, were, were people up in the Thessaloniki area who were devoted 
to developing those who had converted so they could be missionaries to their own people. And because of in our own background in ministry and, and theological education, uh, that, that struck us as the niche that, uh, that we were called to fill. And so we, we, we moved over there. Uh, I like to think of, of our aim this way, uh, whereas the focus often has been what we call soul winning, and the metric for that is just how many people uh, do you study with and baptize. And that's important, it's vital, and there's a whole lot of that happening. I'll share a little bit about that. But what's ultimately going to, to alter the societies that these people are in, what, what's really going to change the congregations and, and the camps, is to have a handful of people who are truly transformed and beginning to live like Jesus. Okay? And so our goal is not so much soul winning as saint making. That's our objective. And what we're trying to do in this is to pour in enough to the people to have it um, produce sufficient leaders for the movement. And so you just think about it this way. We develop persons that are adequate for the spiritual and moral leadership of the movement of those who are turning to Jesus from Islam. It's happening in Greece around the world. Now, that connection between individual persons, uh, kind of the microcosm, and this macrocosm of a whole movement of people who are turning is really important to me because I don't know about you, but I've noticed, you've probably noticed this, that it's very rare for a society or a nation uh, to rise spiritually and ethically far above the level of its leaders. It, when, when the leaders are, are wanting spiritually and ethically, it, it has this way of just kind of legitimating and drawing the rest of the society down. And, and the flip side is that in order to, to really effective movement, in order to really transform a society, there have to be first just a handful within it who are living in a way that is clearly above the fray and, and offering a way forward that others can aspire to. And, and can long to become themselves. And so we're, we're trying to pour into people in order to, to do that uh, with the aim of producing uh, deep change. You can think about it this way. Um, a lot of what happens in what's described as church growth has to do with just getting more Christians. Paul in Ephesians talked about a kind of church growth that he described as creating bigger Christians. Um, growing people into the full stature of Christ, that, that moral, ethical, um, spiritual transformation. And that's what we're aiming at here. Uh, now, the strategy for this that we've um, kind of adopted as we moved in is something that I see in Jesus' own approach. And Jesus' strategy is one that, uh, first of all, is rooted in His understanding of the Father's own character. Um, it's rooted in the, the distinctive kind of person that the Father is, and it, it flows out from there. And the, in, in Matthew chapter 12, we're given this little quotation from uh, the book of Isaiah that is presented as kind of the rationale for how Jesus goes about His work. And, and part of what we see in this uh, is that, uh, that, that Jesus, as He interacts with people, is working off of this, this vision that the Father had provided 600 years before He walked on the scene. And it's, well, it's rather counterintuitive. Okay? But, let me read the whole passage here. I'll start in verse 14 to give you a little bit of context. Jesus just healed somebody. It says in verse 14 of Matthew 12 that the Pharisees went out and counseled together as to how they might destroy Jesus. 
But Jesus, because he knew things, <laughs> withdrew from there. And many followed him and healed all of them. And he warned them not to make him known in order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. And now these words, this is, as it were, Jesus' charter. He says, um, look closely at my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will place my spirit upon him and he shall announce the decision about right living, <laughs> justice, to the nations. Um, the first thing I want you to notice here, we'll, we'll read through the rest of the passage here in a moment, but the, the thing I want you to notice here is that the Father's aim is to announce the right way of living, to, to, to announce justice to the nations. What that means is that the goal, the end result is well, to change the world. It, it, it's the transformation of whole societies, of entire people groups. Okay. Um, it, it's the sort of thing we, we could call movements here. And the way that he's going to go about it, though, is something very different from what the world at large thinks is how you should go about changing the world. And, and part of what we find Jesus running into is this. There's this kind of deep assumption that is there in a lot of religious groups, but also in secular settings, that if you're really going to be serious about bringing justice, if you're really going to be serious about changing the world, you can't let the well-being of a few individuals get in your way. You, you can't be too compassionate in how you deal with with persons and their brokenness and their weakness. Um, you got to stick with the program and drive it through no matter what. For righteousness to be real, this idea says, it's got to be ruthless. It has to be enforced without pity. And in the context, we won't take time to look at it, that's, it, that's what is driving Jesus' opponents. They look at Jesus and they see that he's taking a different tack, and he's encountering each person with compassion, with gentleness, with uncommon respect, and they think, we got to get rid of this guy, because, because you got to crack a few eggs if you're going to make an omelet. Okay? If you're going to make this world different, you got to drive it through. And, um, but what Jesus does instead, and it's, it's rooted here, it's explained in this passage that, that he's working out of, this template, is he comes to people instead with this uncommon gentleness, and through his life example and through his words, he teaches them how to live in step with God. And through that, he opens up a new path, but it's a path that he doesn't, he doesn't whip and drive them down. Um, he, he walks along with them and invites them to follow. Now, as he does this, he's stepping out of everything that the world thinks of about how to change the world. Um, and, and so in this, these next lines, he de this is described. Um, this one that bears the Father's character, the, the Father's servant, uh, he will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he won't break off, and a smoldering wick he won't put out. Um, he, he's not going to be found in the streets uh, making a fight, um, making a ruckus. He, he's not going to uh, be, be shouting and getting people to march down the street. Now, let me just ask you for a second. Have you ever seen or heard of any kind of revolution in which that's not exactly how it happened? And it doesn't matter if it's on the right or the left or anything like that. Every revolution in human history, this is the formula for it. It's the generic formula. How do you change the world? How does the world go about changing the world? Well, you've got to agitate people. 
And then you got to mobilize and you get them out on the street and you scream and you break things and you, know, and you occupy public property or whatever, right? This is how the world goes about changing the world. And the Father just says, when I transform the nations, it won't happen that way. That's not what I'll be doing. Instead, instead, I will come to each person and I will, I will gently bear with that person to transform enough individuals that over time it tilts the balance and the society changes. Okay? Now, we went over in November 2018 with this, this vision of surfacing some potential leaders that we could pour into to, to transform handfuls of persons that could become leaders for the movement. And the question, of course, is like, where do you begin with that? And the, the answer was, um, in a prayerful, attentive way, we started by just noticing what doors that the Lord was opening, and then we stepped through them. And so, before we even got there, I got this, this text from a, a minister in the area who had this um, non-denominational international gathering um, that had started there uh, called Anagenesis, and he was going to be gone for a couple months, and he said, hey, could you come and preach? I'd met him when on the survey trip, and it ended up preaching while on the survey trip. And so I just, I thought, well, we don't have a launch date, so now we do. And so we landed, and two days later, uh, I started preaching for this gathering. Now this gathering, there's over 20 different nationalities and languages represented in the group. And so I, I would preach in English on the, the screen behind me, you have the text that I am speaking from, and it's scrolling in, in English, in Greek, in Arabic, and in Farsi, and there's simultaneous translation going into these languages, and, and often from Arabic over to Kurdish as well. Um, so this was wonderful because it's where most of the refugees who were converting or seeking in the area were coming, and so it instantly... Um, introduced me to the people that I went there in order to train. Now, uh, Carly would uh, take over the, the children's program soon after we got there, and so she was um, teaching again with all these different languages and cultures mixed together, uh, which is exhilarating and messy, and there's plenty of opportunities to, um, well, to hurt each other and repent. Okay, and that's that's how life goes when you come together like that. Now, uh, we had uh, prayer gatherings and retreats, uh, and uh, there were um, over thirty baptisms that we were personally involved with, and then uh, quite a number um, out beyond that. And so, it, uh, there's this kind of beautiful fruitfulness that we were able to step into, uh, and. Um, and participate in this movement. But part of what, um, oh, <laughs> and Middle Eastern hospitality. As we, uh, as we served people there and got to be friends uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the people that were gathering, the refugees, uh, they started inviting us over. And so we're in their homes, um, out in the camp, in these little container apartments, and later some of them were uh, moved into regular apartments uh, around uh, the northern Greece. And I don't know if you've ever experienced Middle Eastern hospitality, but go with your stomach empty because you're going to have a hard time walking out, okay? Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, through all of this, those mentoring relations emerged that is what we went there for, okay, in, in order to pour into particular people. And what I want to do for a little bit of time here now is to just kind of pull the thread at the intersection, at one intersection of this web of relations that we've stepped into and developed over the last couple years, and, and, and follow that a little bit. We, we won't be able to get to the end of that thread, but I want to introduce you to uh, some particular people. So, 
among the first group of those that we baptized uh, were Kava and Lily. And I, I, they've become so dear to us. I want to tell you uh, about Kava and Lily and then some of the people that we've come in contact through them. Now, their story begins back in Iran. They're living in Tehran. Um, Lily is from a family in which all the men are part of the um, police intelligence, which is a religious order in Iran, uh, Islamic. And Kava, at the time, was a rappelling instructor and a rope access uh, technician. And uh, anyhow, they, uh, they, they married. Kava was kind of disaffected with Islam, flirting with atheism, but couldn't all the way buy it. But Lily became interested in Christianity through contact with some Christians and got her hands on the New Testament. And so she started looking into it. She, she hadn't converted all the way, but, but she was kind of curious. And what happened is that her family got wind of it. And so they started to, initially in a veiled way, issue some threats, but then they became more and more explicit and more and more intense until eventually um, they said that they were going to kill little Artemis, who was not even quite a year at the time. And that's the point at which Kava said, we've got to get out of here. And so Kava takes his family, and they escape across into Turkey. And in Turkey is where the kind of the story changes for Kava. Um, while in Turkey, living in tents in the in, in refugee camps there, uh, Kava has this experience of, well, he calls it darkness that settled upon him. Okay? It was intense, and he didn't know what to do about it. And it was so distressing that he begins to try to pray, but nothing's happening. He's praying as he knows how to pray from Islam, but there's no response. And so one day, as this continues for months, one day he's lying in his tent at night, and as he describes it to his right, there's little Artemis between him and Lily. And as he tries to pray and nothing's happening, he hears something in his left ear. And it's a voice that just says, say in Jesus' name, pray in Jesus' name. And so he tries it. He, he, he cries out, and this time he cries out in the name of Jesus, and suddenly something happens. And inside, the darkness lifts, is the way he describes it. And the thing is, if you take a look at Kava, you'll, um, that, that picture tells you a lot, because his face glows. He is one of the most open, beautiful, um, kind of welcoming people that you can see. It's hard for me to imagine what Kava with darkness upon him would look like because he ra he's just radiant now. But it, it lifts at that moment. Now, at that point, Kava knows something. He knows that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is active, that there's power in this name, that, that he responds to prayer, but there's a lot that he doesn't know. Um, <laughs> he doesn't have a clue about who Jesus is apart from the fact that he's the one who answers prayer today. He, he, he knows that he's, it's a name attached to a prophet in Islam. Um, back before Muhammad, but he, he doesn't know any of his teaching, he doesn't know anything about his story, he doesn't know anything about his character, and, and that's kind of common among those that we come in contact with in terms of the, the first blush. It's almost the mirror image of what we see often in the U.S., where we encounter people in the U.S. who often know a fair bit about Jesus' story, and they've read some of his teachings and so forth, but they don't know that he's doing, doing anything today, that he's responsive to prayer in real life today. There, it's the mirror image. They know he's alive, they just don't know who he is. They know he acts, stand his character, or know any of his teaching. And so, what happens is, at this point, he starts searching, and... He's searching, interacts with some Christians in Turkey, makes it across to Greece, ends up there 
in this, this gathering at Anagenesis where we take him through, um, you know, pre-baptismal teaching and all of that. And he's among this first group that's baptized. Now, Kava is a very gifted evangelist because, well, for a number of reasons, but God is just working through him and he's incredibly open. Um, and that also has meant that he has been beaten a lot in the camp. Okay? He was mobbed by about 70 people at one point and um, beaten with, uh, with wood um, that they pulled off of an old pallet. But, um, but he continues um, as he shares Jesus. Now, as we connected and started spending more time together, uh, it was through Kava then that I was introduced to Ali. And this is Kava and Ali together just a, uh, a few weeks ago. But Ali's story... Um, Ali's also um, from Iran. He's half Afghani, half, uh, half Persian uh, in terms of ancestry. But um, Ali's story, um, in order to, to understand it, you need to know a couple things. First, that it's filled with kind of some unspeakable abuse and suffering. Um, he has some webbing between his fingers that is there because his mother tried to abort him and she told him about it. Okay. And then when he's, he's very young, five, six years old, his parents tell him, well, you can go to school for you, but you got to work and bring home money for us. And they, they send him off to work in this chicken farm where he's raped and abused. Um, and so just unspeakable suffering, which, which led to a lot of, of bitterness and pain inside hatred towards the people who had hurt him. Um, another thing you need to know about Ali is uh, that he was the most devout Muslim that I've ever met, I think. And I've had interaction with a lot of Muslims, but he wasn't just a cultural Muslim. He, he had chosen it. He, he'd even learned classical Arabic so he could read the Quran. Um, now, he escapes, he, he leaves um, Iran as an unaccompanied minor at age 17. He travels six months, on, uh, eight months on foot, and after several unsuccessful attempts, he makes it across into Greece. There he meets um, Kava, and we start interacting, and, and Ali comes to, to listen to the teachings that are happening also at church. Now, uh, as it happened, I was teaching this very long series, like eight weeks, on Jesus' teachings concerning forgiveness. And Ali was, he was really processing this, and uh, he had questions, and because he came initially to church in order to correct these kind but obviously deceived people who were believing that Jesus was more than just a prophet before, before Muhammad. And so he's listening to this, and he had all sorts of questions, but what happened was over the course of these weeks, he becomes convinced that Jesus' teachings about forgiveness are true and that it's the only way forward for his life. And that brings him to the point where he realizes he needs to forgive the people who raped him. And just when he realizes that, that he needs to forgive, he also realizes that he's incapable of forgiving. And he's, he's stuck. And the way that he describes it, one night he... he he just paces for hours outside of the Diavada camp up and down the street. And he starts to pray, and, and he's asking, he, he tells God, he says, I know I need to forgive, but I'm incapable. I, I, just, I can't let go inside. I can't release that. You're going to have to help me. And suddenly he finds that God enables him to forgive. He, he's able to act on Jesus' teaching, even though at this point, he still, he knows that Jesus is a prophet, but he doesn't believe that, that he's divine. He's not a Christian. Okay? But that, that really changes things for him, so much so, and he, he, he tells us about it. Well, we continue to, to, to interact, and, and, and I'm very, I'm trying to follow this, this kind of model that Jesus has, 
in terms of gentle interaction. Part of what we see with Jesus in, in this, it says, a, a bruised reed he will not snap. He won't break. Let me just say what that means. You see, with, with a reed that's been partially broken but not completely, it's no longer structurally sound. You can't use it. You can't lean on it. It would break. You can't put put it into the wall. It's not going to hold anything together. So what most people would do is you just snap it and toss it in the fire, right? What this is referring to is that the Father and Jesus in His way, He will not dispense with an individual in our brokenness in order to achieve this social outcome, the just society that he's aiming for. Okay? I don't know if you know that, that the Father would not have a perfect world, a just society, if that meant that you weren't in it. Okay? He cares about each of you personally, deeply, that much. And so, He will not leave us behind in our woundedness, bearing the wounds that we bring with us. He won't leave us behind in order to get that, that movement result. He, he works with the person in order to bind up what's bruised. Likewise, a, a smoldering wick, it's, it, it's just smoke at this point, mostly, and you might just snuff it out. But instead, what, what Jesus does, what the Father would do, is fan into flame what is still alive within each person and to bring that uh, to completion. Well, part of what happened in Ali's story is that there were others in our group that felt they needed to, uh, well, they, they felt compelled to... Uh, go more on the offensive with regard to Islam and things like that, okay? And so they'd corner him and want to tell, them, tell him everything that they saw that was wrong uh, with Islam. When we got together, I didn't talk about Islam at all with Ali. I just, we talked about Jesus. And uh, those conversations that he had where he was kind of under attack um, were, were unhelpful and were distressing to him. And one Sunday that was happening kind of around the edges, uh, and I managed to kind of extract him and <laughs> get him away uh, where he wasn't so much being fired at. And we were talking at this point, he, and he got, he got kind of quiet and reflective for a moment. He looked up and he said, you know, it is true, I love Jesus more than Mohammed, but I'm still a Muslim. And I just said, okay, okay. Now, inside, I thought, that's got an expiration date, you know. There, there's no way that that lasts because God was obviously at work in him. Jesus' teaching had taken root. His character was becoming visible in such a way that he had literally fallen in love with Jesus. He just, he wasn't all the way there yet. It was that kind of messy halfway point. And that's okay. The Father... The Father's strategy that Jesus enacts is one in which we take it at the, at the pace of the person. Um, and so, it was a few months later when I walked into the refugee care center, and there's Kava and Ali and some other guys, and, and both of them are just kind of bubbling and excited because the night before, um, there in Kava's little container apartment, uh, Ali had kind of, the, the penny had dropped. He finally had realized, like, I've got to become a Christian. I need to leave Islam, become a Christian, right? And he, and he wanted to be baptized. And so, um, anyhow, uh, ended up baptizing him at the foot of Mount Olympus. Um, that's where, where this pool is. And anyhow, after Ali asked, he said, do you want to know we went out to dinner, and we're talking, and he said, do you want to know why it took me so long to become a Christian? I was like, yeah, definitely. Um, I need insight into all this. But in my mind, I was thinking, I didn't think it was that long, because I mean, it was like a six to eight month, you know, from when we met um, to when he converts. And to me, that went pretty fast, but to him, it was long and slow because he was wrestling the whole way. And this is what he told me. He said, 
in Islam there's God, but if you leave Islam, there is no God. Like in his mind, it was just Islam or atheism. And those were the categories. And what he told me was, I wasn't ready to live without a God. But what happened was, he said, is as I got to know Jesus and Jesus' teachings about the Father, what I suddenly realized was that with Jesus, not only is there a God, but God is so much better than Muhammad imagined. Right? And so he said, at that point, now I could let go of Islam because I knew the Father through Jesus. Okay? Now, um, I don't think we have time. I'll, um, I'll just tell you, Joshua and Sarah, I wish I could tell you her story. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, they're working in a camp uh, about 30 minutes out of Thessaloniki called Vallahori, and uh, at this point they've got a group of about 15, 20 um, from Afghanistan um, that have converted in their group. Um, but this is another one, and uh, there's, there's quite a number that I could tell you about that just following this one thread. Um, but let's come back to Matthew chapter 12 and wrap this up. Um, it's interesting when you read quotations from the Old Testament in the New to notice any time they've been enhanced or altered. Okay? And in this passage, there's only two words that are added uh, to the text from Isaiah, and it's the words unto victory or into success, that he will, he will lead right living, he'll lead justice until it succeeds. Okay? Now, why, why is, that, is that added, um, the, the unto victory? It's because Jesus and now Matthew want us to know, by the way, this is going to work. Okay? There's no pipe dream involved. This process of, of gently, lovingly, patiently coming to individuals and transforming one life at a time until the balance in the society shifts and then the whole society follows, it will work. And we just point out, 2,000 years later, we can point out that it's historical fact that it has worked dozens and dozens and dozens of times around the world, it works. It has worked, and it, wor it will work again and again. Now, and then we're told what it is about this gentleness of the Father's character that, that ultimately changes people and societies. What's the active ingredient? The active ingredient is hope. It says, and in His name, in His character in this gentle, loving way of being with people, the nations will hope. Now, you already know, you already know that, that hope is what is needed to fuel change. You know it because you've had the experience, I'm sure, of somebody convincing you, despite this great picture that you have, that it just won't work, and you've experienced all of your motivation leak out and go away. If you remove hope, it stifles any possibility of moral spiritual change. The flip side is, when you see that God is on your side, when you see His character that is behind you, you know you're not in this alone, and that hope is what fuels the kind of change that transforms individual persons and transforms ultimately the world. So, thank you.